Now, there is a term here, the noise temperature, that is related also to antennas, that mostly uh, uh, deal with the, or interest in satellite communication. Why is that? We will see in a minute. And uh, if we look at, on this basic scheme of, of any system that is connected to an antenna, we have an antenna and a receiver. We are, we are now talking about uh, uh, receiving. Um, and we assume as a radio frequency designers that the noise in the terminals of our receiver is minus 170 dBm per hertz. But actually, when we are uh, dealing with satellite communication, this is not actually the, uh, the actually right. Um, if we look at the next slide, uh, let's examine the following uh, example. If we look at the uh, radiation pattern of an antenna that looks uh, towards the horizon, we can see that half of it is above ground level, while the other, uh, the other half is sees the ground level, uh, below ground. Okay, so the ground is 300 degrees Kelvin, if we assume an average temperature between all cases on our planet. And the uh, upper half of the radiation pattern, that the one that sees the sky, actually feels almost zero degrees Kelvin. If we uh, make an average of this, then we can say that half multiplied by zero plus half multiplied by 300 is 150 degrees Kelvin. In order to calculate the noise, then we have to uh, do 10 log Boltzmann constant, uh, which is uh, here listed, uh, written here in the bottom of the slide, uh, multiplied by the temperature of the antenna, uh, which is in our case 150 degrees Kelvin, and then it yields minus 177 dBm per hertz and not minus 174 dBm per hertz. Of course, if we uh, elevate the antenna towards the sky, then the temperature, the noise temperature of the antenna will reduce. If we uh, look f uh, uh, just perpendicular to the ground towards the sky, I mean, uh, we have an antenna that observe that radiates up, then the temperature will be minimal. In order to help uh, those guys of you that uh, have to deal with this inconvenient uh, term of uh, antennas, uh, which is the noise uh, temperature, then uh, here is a, a thumb rule table that will assist you. If you have a 34 dBi antenna, uh, yeah, approximately, of a 34 dBi antenna, then if you look to the horizon, okay, then you will see 150 degrees Kelvin. Of course, this is, uh, doesn't depend on the gain of the antenna because half of the radiation pattern is below ground and half of the radiation pattern is above ground. If the antenna is 30 degrees above horizon, then most of the main beam sees the sky while the, uh, only a small part of the side lobes and back lobe see uh, the ground. Then the temperature of the antenna would be approximately 30 degrees Kelvin. This is most relevant for all the satellite TV communication antennas which are around these figures. And 90 degrees above uh, horizon, this is approximately 5 degrees Kelvin. If you calculate the 5 degrees Kelvin in the uh, noise uh, formula that we have seen in the previous slide, then you will get much lower energy than mi minus 174 dBm per hertz. Okay, now uh, I want to discuss uh, terms that uh, are widely spread uh, in antenna area. This is the far field, the near field, and the Fresnel field. This is not actually fields because the fields are only electric or magnetic fields. These are actually zones. This is a ranges from the antenna in which the electric and magnetic fields behave in a certain way. 
let's start for the, for, from the far field. The far field is the zone where the uh, electric and magnetic field are per perpendicular, as we discussed before. The far field is the being far enough from the antenna that we uh, actually get a planar wave. Where this starts, actually, it starts uh, in ranges that are longer than twice the antenna aperture square divided by the wavelength. But practically, practically we have to uh, be careful here. Why? Because if we have very small antennas, then uh, this number here might be a uh, very small uh, assuming we have a, let's say a monopole antenna and a, a, a wavelength which is uh, four times than the monopole antenna then uh, theoretically the uh, if we put it in this formula you will see that uh, the far field starts very close to the antenna but practically we have to uh, get away from the antenna at least five wavelengths. Why? Because I remind, remind you the sphere that is around the antenna. Okay, if we are too close to the antenna and we try to look on a piece of this sphere, it won't be like a rectangular, planar rectangular. It, the, the sphere is too close and the radius is too small, then we won't get any place that where the uh, fields are the same in phase and amplitude and we want that to uh, ha to happen so we have to get away from the antenna so the sphere gets bigger and if we cut a, a, a slice in the sphere where uh, uh, in the size of a receiving antenna actually then it will be much like of a planar rectangular and we want to be in a zone where the sphere becomes much planar if we look at the small size, small part of it. The next term is the near field. The near field is the actually the zone where the electric field and the magnetic field doesn't really radiate. It only it's like the generation zone of the radiation. Yeah. The, strong, the fields in this zone are very strong and, uh, uh, and this is very close to the antenna. We can look that uh, on the traditional definition of it as 2 pi per wavelength. Uh, you can understand this is very, very close to the antenna. Uh, and from this range to the far field, we have, we have some distance that defined as Fresnel zone. Fresnel zone, this is the zone where the fields become from the strong and generation area to the become the planar wave where the electric wave and the electric field and the horizontal field are perpendicular. All this range from the antenna that the fields are shaped to the to the to perform like a planar wave this is the fresnel zone and another term in the antenna area which is totally different than what we discussed now is the space loss let's now uh, talk about the space loss um, let's look on the antenna here in the drawing and assume it radiates an energy in all direction only directional or uh, isotropic antenna uh, let's say, let's assume it radiates it equally towards all directions. Then, what do we see here? If we take the energy at, let's say we freeze the time after one second, then, and the energy spreads away from the antenna, then we will get a ball of a certain size in which all the energy is uh, uh, located inside. Then, we will let the energy propagate further and we stop the uh, uh, time again in after two seconds. Then, of course, the sphere of energy that radiates from the antenna was increased two times. Okay, and now, but the same power that w was captured in the small sphere uh, in the uh, one second freeze is the same energy that is 
uh, captured in the uh, two seconds uh, sphere. So in this case, we understand that since the ball is the, the sphere is getting bigger and bigger, then the power density on its surface has to get lower and lower as we get away from the antenna. For a small sphere, the area of the surface of the sphere, of the imaginary sphere around the antenna, is small. As we get away from the antenna, the surface of the sphere becomes much, much bigger. And then the energy has to spread upon all the surface. Then the power density becomes lower and lower as we get away from the antenna. Okay, here there is some, something I want to emphasize. Antennas, okay, we, we measure distance in, in meters, but antennas doesn't really care much about meters. Okay, because, because uh, uh, antennas has, has different frequencies. The units that antennas are, are uh, interested in are, is wavelength. So, everything I measure in wavelengths, the distance I measure in wavelengths, the area of the sphere I also, I also measure in wavelength square. That's why in this formula here we see R per lambda which means the distance between the distance in wavelengths okay the distance in met we take the radius in meters we divide it by lambda and then we we get the distance in wavelengths and what is actually 4 pi distance in wavelengths this is actually the area of the uh, sphere the area of the sphere increases as we get away from the antenna. And the power stays the same. This is the same power that we injected to the antenna. So if we take this same power and we divide it to an increasing, an increasing area, then we will get a reduction in the power density. And the power density is the loss that we will have as the uh, energy propagates away. So, if we look, this is the uh, formula that represents this. We will look at it. This is 20 look, log 4 pi multiplied by uh, r that represents the range uh, divided by wavelength. And uh, uh, this actually uh, represents how much the energy fades in case we have a vacuum volume between the antenna and the point that interests us. What do we need this space for? Uh, space loss uh, for? We need it uh, for link uh, budget uh, calculations. Uh, this is very important, of course, for system design. Uh, if you look at the link that uh, we have a transmitting antenna and receiving antenna, which are uh, uh, R meters apart from each other, then the uh, power that will be received by the receiving uh, by the receiver is equal to the uh, power uh, that was transmitted by the transmitter plus the gain of the transmitting antenna and i, remi I remind here that the uh, gain is not uh, uh, amplifying the signal it's actually directing the the energy towards the specific direction and not spilling it all of, all around and uh, again, plus the uh, gain of the receiving antenna minus the space loss. The space loss is the 20 log 4 pi r divided by uh, wavelength. And uh, the space loss here, uh, the, this, uh, uh, one thing that I want to emphasize about this formula that it uh, consider only cases when the energy is, uh, is propagating in a in a vacuum, not in any other volume that has losses. If we have rain or we have dust, then the loss will be increased. And also uh, just a general uh, uh, atmosphere uh, has uh, particles, ions, dust, uh, humidity that uh, uh, interfere with uh, uh, with uh, uh, a convenient propagation or uh, optimal propagation of a wave 
uh, of a, an, electro, uh, uh, an electromagnetic wave, and this formula doesn't take in account any of uh, of these. Uh, it uh, assumes the medium is a vacuum, pure vacuum. So, of course, in uh, true life, uh, the volume between two antennas is not a vacuum. It's actually uh, contain all the particles that we uh, talked about, uh, the dust, ions, humidity, etc., etc. And in this uh, slide, we see how the atmosphere interfere with electromagnetic propagation in different frequencies. One of the uh, most uh, interesting uh, frequencies is the uh, K-band 22 gigahertz, which, which is the first resonance frequency of water. Uh, if we have humidity in the air, then we, will, we see how the, uh, the um, loss increases at 22 gigahertz. Of course, we see other resonance frequencies of the atmosphere. Uh, of uh, of planet Earth, uh, some of them is only oxygen. Let's say for this one, which is around 60 gigahertz, is oxygen, and uh, the first one is water. And here I want uh, uh, to uh, say something about uh, a legend that is commonly known uh, related to a uh, microwave ovens. Okay, uh, as everybody, uh, as I heard many times. Microwave oven resonant the uh, water molecules at 2.4 gigahertz, and that's what causes the f uh, food to to be heated. Well, this is a legend. Of course, uh, it's it doesn't happen. The first resonance of water is 22 gigahertz. The 2.4 gigahertz is the frequency that uh, was uh, used traditionally for a microwave. Uh, oven design. There are also microwave oven, uh, industrial microwave ovens at 900 megahertz. So uh, heating up, up food doesn't really have nothing to do with the resonance of water molecules, uh, which we see here uh, resonance, uh, a resonant first only at 22 gigahertz. Uh, the microwave oven heating, if we discuss this uh, uh, is uh, only a dielectric heating. If I remind you the dielectric losses that we discussed uh, previously, then the dielectric losses has also on food. The food has a lot of dielectric uh, losses and the dielectric losses cause, causes the uh, electric electromagnetic energy to turn into heat. And this is what heats up the food and not the resonance of water molecules as uh, I've heard in many cases that people, it becomes a legend of some sort, I don't know why. We have arrived uh, to the last slide of this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you.